Okay. Yeah. I actually will do it. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Jeff here with us today. He's, of course, going to talk about uh, machine learning related things, as is you know, very popular these days. Uh, I know Jeff for over 20 years. I met him when he was a postdoc at Argonne. And then over the years, he has been to you know, some uh, private sector jobs and then Lehigh. And finally, uh, he is in Wisconsin for more than 10 years now, I guess. Yeah, uh, 14, on our 14th okay. year. Uh, he's been heading the chair, uh, he was the chair of the department for the last few years. And finally it's over and he's back to you know, giving talks and uh, starting breathing again. And we're <laughs> really happy to have him here. Thank you, Akhtai. It's really a great pleasure uh, to be here. I enjoy <coughs> coming here. I already see the first mistake on my slide. So the S, the extra S doesn't mean it has no hidden meaning. I'll have a lot of jokes in my slides, but that's just a mistake, not, not a joke. This is joint work with uh, a talented and relatively new graduate student, Eka Lesch, and our colleague from biostatistics, Daniel. Jim and I, Jim Lutke and I, are both in industrial and systems engineering and are longtime time colleagues. So what I'm going to tell you about today is a problem called what that the community calls subspace clustering with missing data. So there are some experts, many experts in at Cornell. Uh, I'm a little intimidated uh, on data science, a little intimidated to give this talk, but I'm going to at least start out at a relatively basic level to tell you what I mean. What is the subspace clustering problem? What is the matrix completion problem? And then this subspace clustering with missing data problem is the, the sort of these two great things that go great together. It's the sort of the combination of those two problems. And then I'm going to talk about, so I'll tell you about the, some known methods for solving those problems. And then I'll sort of say, what if you were like me? What if you were training, one, or Octai for that matter? What if you're an integer programmer? and you wanted to try to start doing machine learning, how would you think about trying to solve this problem? And I'll show you two formulations uh, for to try to solve this problem. One that I came up with all by myself, and then one that uh, Jim Lutke came up with um, that ended up being the way that we've implemented and share finally then some, hopefully, what I think are promising computational results. So like as Octai sort of alluded to, it seems like optimization people are just turning you know, their heads away from seemingly every other application and working on machine learning. And so now that I'm no longer department chair, I also wanted to get in, get in on in the action as well. So this is just a, a way of saying, please be gentle with me when I sort of show my machine learning naivete in, in the rest of this talk. Um, but I'm going to tell you about the subspace clustering problem. Okay, so it's a, it's a very geometric problem. I'm going to give you n points in ambient dimension D. And you think that these points, you think you, you have some structural assumption about these points, that they probably lie on or close to these given points a small number of low dimensional subspaces. So these aren't just points like out there in general position, but you think that they, that they sort of belong to like a small number of you know, low rank or low dimensional subspaces. And for purposes of this talk, there are things that we can relax on this just to make it more clear. We're gonna kind of in some sense always assume that we know that we know that the points lie on exactly K subspaces. So you're either on this subspace or this subspace, one of K, of K subspaces. And we know the dimension of each of those subspaces exactly. And they're all going to be the same in this case. They're all going to be dimension R. But in these data problems, the ambient dimension of your data right, tends to be, or at least can be, much higher than sort of the real dimension of the data. Like they live in this sort of lower dimensional, or union actually, of lower dimensional subspaces. And subspace clustering then is, tell me, what those subspaces are, and which points then belong to those subspaces. That is the subspace clustering problem. There are, people are asking me this morning about what, where does this come from? Who, who came up with this? I, I certainly didn't. This is a, I think a canonical, I was told it was a canonical problem in the machine learning 
machine learning community, and the one application that I know a little bit about is that it's used to sort of track, if you track trajectories of, of objects, different, so there's a subspace for every object, and if you sort of advance it through time and you want to understand which of these sort of pixels belong to the same object, then these, you, the, the correct model would be that these points of the frame belong on a, on a small number of low dimensional subspaces. But there are lots of, there are applications of this. Um, this gene expression profile clustering was the one that our machine learning colleague Daniel uh, was most interested in. And the, the point is, is that this just isn't, I mean, clustering is maybe, many of you probably teach machine learning, might be the first thing, you know, you teach, or one of the very first things you teach in, in uh, you know, data science is like these points have some relation, I want to cluster them together, but this is like, and we want to do the same thing, although the same doesn't really mean that the points necessarily are close in space, the closeness is with respect to like lying on this subspace. So we need to sort of take that into account in the methods that we use. Yes, I love questions, by the way. Please. Can hold one slide? Oh, of course. Did I make another mistake? No. Uh, so, will water channels will apply to the case when D is actually about the same waters? Yes. D so actually, so I will tell you about that and the method. I, you're you're my new favorite person. Thank you for that question because the method, the method that we're going to apply actually works remarkably well in this sort of very different data regime, what they call high rank matrix completion as opposed to low rank matrix completion when the ambient dimension D is close to KR. And I actually have a slide on that at the end. Um, uh, fabulous. Okay. Um, so yeah, so let me just give you just a few pictures just sort of maybe it's, maybe it's obvious, I'm sure it's obvious to all of you in the audience, but just to, to make it a little more uh, plain and, and geometric. So I just give you a bunch. So here's the points that you're given, in this case, three-dimensional space. They don't look like they have a lot of relation to them, but actually if you co start coloring the points, so like this clustering process is like, oh, these are the right points that I want to put together, and then you realize actually that those points that I drew there, if you spun this around a little bit, actually belong to you know, there's a one two-dimensional subspace and then two one-dimensional subspaces that perfectly describe that data. Here, actually, KR is actually even bigger than D. Usually, that's the opposite. But in general, this is, it was hard for me to draw in. I don't have my 32-dimensional graph paper. So we have to, like, so, but the point is you sort of have to color, cluster the points, and also identify the subspace. So that's the ge ge geometry of the subspace clustering graph. So our colleagues, so this is not an interesting problem, at least from a machine learning point of view, from what I understand. This, so Daniel, who is uh, there, he said this problem is very easy in the sense that it's sort of like well understood, <laughs> at least empirically, how to solve this problem. And in fact, if you sort of just make the assumption, right, that there was no noise, you know, in, in the points, right, you can just check, right? I mean, you only need if I want to find a r-dimensional subspace, I just need to like, I could just take r points, figure out what subspace goes through those r points, and then check if some other points fall on that subspace. So you can sort of figure out these subspaces just by enumerating which points should potentially go together. Um, in that sense, the problem is easy, but of course, we in practice, they don't do it this way. They've developed algorithms that work very well in practice to solve this problem. One that I'm going to tell you about here is I'm going to tell you about because it's sort of we use it later on or compare against a, a version of this that's adapted to our problem later on. It's called sparse subspace clustering. It's a very intuitive method, I think. I mean, what does it mean for points to be in the same subspace? It means I can take one point and write it as a linear combination of a bunch of the other points and actually a sparse linear combination uh, if I want to find a low dimensional subspace. So that is what this sparse subspace clustering does. It says for every, for every column or for every point, try to write that point as a sparse linear combination of the other points. And it, it says here we use this uh, L1 lasso type thing that they love to do in machine learning to induce the sparsity of the number of other points that you're going to use in the, in, for the weights that you're going to write the other point as. So this tells you sort of, we do this for every point, and you know, if this sort of tells you for each point what other points it has an affinity for, or it was like had a positive weight, 
then you sort of put those all together. Maybe you make these, this affinity symmetric, because probably it makes sense to do that, because this is certainly not going to be a, probably a unique solution. And then, so once you understand the affinity for all the points one for the other, then you just do clustering of those points. And like you can use your favorite sort of regular type of clustering where you sort of move the subspace, like sort of metric, if you will, into something that's a little bit where it makes sense to just do like what you would normally do to cluster points together. Okay? Any questions on this? Sorry, it's being a little basic. I have about... I promise to get into your programming soon. Um, the, the, the last little bit of this is just that you can certainly adapt this to the case where the points don't lay exactly on the same subspace and you can combine sparsity with sort of a closeness metric with how much you want to weigh these things off. And you solve this one optimization problem then to get the uh, affinities and then you do the clustering. This is sparse subspace clustering. That's all I'm going to tell you about the clusters, subspace clustering problem. Now I'm going to tell you very briefly about low rank matrix completion, because probably everyone in this room knows the Netflix problem. Raise your hand if you don't know the Netflix problem. See, this is what they tell you to do. With, yeah, of course, no one raises their hand. So when you learn to be a professor, there are some students in the audience, they go and well, you should never ask the class who doesn't know something, because no one will ever raise their hand in that case. So, so you should never do that. Um, so I will briefly tell you what it is, but this is a very, this is even a more classical or important problem in machine learning, where you're given a bunch of, <clears throat> you're given a matrix, or I can arrange the, the column, or the points as columns of this matrix, but here I don't know all of the entries of the matrix. I don't know all the coordinates of the points. And so the, the, for Netflix or for other recommender systems, the question is fill in the rest of the matrix, given some of these, which is impossible unless you assume some structural assumption of what those points might look like. And here we assume that the matrix itself is low rank. There's just a few factors that sort of influence what the other, uh, what the other coordinates of those points would be. So it's low rank, so we can write it as uh, this low rank matrix approximation where, so for Netflix, right, we have some people we have movies and how much they like them, and, I, and we think that I can write that as some, there's some smaller number of factors that, did, that how much does every person sort of, with respect to those factors, influence the movies, and then you have like an exposure of that movie to those factors, if you will. They do the same thing in finance and things like that as well. So this is, this is the low rank matrix completion problem. This, of course, is also, in some sense, an easy problem. At least from an empirical point of view, there are people in the audience who know a lot more about this, done some amazing work. They know a lot about this both computationally, empirically, and theoretically about like when all of these algorithms that work amazingly well in practice can also recover, recover the true matrix uh, sort of with high probability or with probability one. There's tons of methods for solving this problem, things from semi-definite programming based methods to sort of more iterative methods. I'm going to explain one method because we're going to compare against that later on. I sort of like it because uh, it has a nice ac acronym, but it's also like a, an intuitive method to me, and it actually turns out, in our context, turns out to work rather well, at least um, in our computational experiments. It's called GROUSE, so it stands for this Grismatian Rank 1 Update Subspace Estimation. Um, and it works as follows. It's, I mean, there's lots of notation here, but it's like very, it's again, very geometric idea. It's, um, so we're gonna it sort of, it, it actually, Grouse was designed, most of this wasn't actually even designed to solve like the, say, wasn't really designed to solve the matrix completion problem in an offline manner. It was designed for actually like online matrix completion where the columns of the matrix were sort of coming in one by one. And that's why I think that what, what is the uh, update? The U stands for like when you're getting new data coming online and you want to update your subspace approximation. But you can use it for regular old matrix completion and it works as follows. So pretend you have some reasonable approximation of the subspace that you, that's going to be the U in your X equals UV factorization. And then just pick a random column of the matrix for which you know just some of the elements. Okay. That column, or at least in the coordinates that you know, is sort of like, it's either right on the subspace or kind of off the subspace, but you can kind of calculate if I wanted to, 
try to come as close as possible of writing the coordinates that I know of the point as a linear combination of the basis that I currently have. How would I do that? So I get these weights, W. Right, you can then predict what the full vector would be. Right, you can compute what your error was, at least on, this is sort of just a notation for the observed elements. And then it's sort of like, so here's your subspace, here's the point, you compute a projection, you'd be like, well, it sort of makes sense to just tilt the, given this new information I've received, it makes sense to tilt the subspace sort of in this way. So U gets tilted, this is actually just a rank one, that's probably, that's rank one in <laughs> the title. This is just like a simple like update of that matrix. And then you just keep doing this over and over and magically this works and converges often in, under a, some data assumptions. It's just like tilt, 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 tilt. This is graphs, how I understand it. It's a, it's a fast algorithm that works, you know, surprisingly well. Like this was new to me. You, many of you know this, but like somehow when you're learning a new field, you kind of have to try things out for yourself. And I've never sort of seen this before. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. Like the fact, so here's just a little empirical plot that shows for this Grouse algorithm, or for, it, it's not, this isn't Grouse, it, it could be Grouse, it could be any, for any reasonable method for matrix completion, what we did is we just took a matrix where we knew all of the elements, so we knew ground truth. We kept removing more here, we removed 10%, 20%, 30%, more and more and more and more and more of the data. And for this thing you can, <coughs> excuse me, remove up to 80% of the matrix, so you only know 20% of the data, you run this simple algorithm, and you just always recover the ground truth. Yeah. Um, and, but then quickly, at a certain point, this is also characteristic of these things, there's this threshold where, where, for which that you just don't have, even from an information theoretic point of view, you just don't have enough to be able to do anything reasonable to recover the matrix. So, but it was amazing that you, know, you can remove this amount of the data and still recover the matrix perfectly. All right, so, so that's, I told you about subspace clustering, right? Color, you think that the points, you know all of the coordinates of the points, and you posit that they lie on a small number of low-dimensional subspaces. And I told you about matrix completion where we think there's just one low-dimensional subspace, but we don't know all of the data. And subspace clustering with missing data is putting these two things together. And that's really what it is. So we. We have to, we don't know the whole matrix, right? But we, but we still need to sort of color the columns or cluster them appropriately. And then within that cluster, we need to find a basis uh, for that low rank uh, subspace. Yeah, and so here's, here's your point here. And then often we'll get to this point is sometimes people call it, what is high rank, what does that mean? High rank matrix completion. And what it means is precisely that, you know, when the data dimension KR is closer to D. So the, it might be that if you know the data is really in general position out there and you can't really do anything with it, but quite often there's more structure there. And it might be that really, even if you're using all of the data dimension, it might be that the points aren't oriented as a cloud, but they're really sort of like some lower, there's structure within. And you wanna to try to recover that structure as well. Identify it if it exists and recover it as well. So that's the high rank case. And from what I understand, often algorithms that work well in a high rate case work less well in the case where uh, the ambient dimension is much larger than the data dimension. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you how to solve or at least some known methods for solving this problem. Um, this is like the most natural, this is the way I would do it if I had to, the first idea that one would have. So we know we, we learned about the sparse subspace clustering method. Well, let's just somehow apply that to this problem where you have missing data. Well, what do we do with the coordinates we don't know? Well, let's just put zeros in there, essentially. Is what, so we put zeros in there, and then we run sparse subspace clustering. On, so it's called zero field sparse subspace clustering. Very simple <coughs> algorithm. But that's not the only approach. Like, I wish I knew all these methods. I did read this paper relatively carefully, but this, uh, re, uh, maybe three, four years ago, a survey paper of all these different types of methods with very impermeable acronyms for how they work um, for solving this, this problem, the sparse, the subspace clustering of missing data problem. Actually, from this paper, the two methods that work, and what I'm gonna 
tell you about next that work the best, better than just zero fill uh, SSC, sparse subspace cluster, there are some fancy version, a little bit fancier or iterative version of that in some sense. And then this KSSMD is an adaptation of the Grouse method to multiple subspaces. So I just have one slide on both of these methods. I'll do the first one first. But it's actually the, this, I don't know why they give it such a complicated acronym. But essentially, it's sparse subspace clustering done iteratively. So first you do sparse subspace clustering to get some clusters. Okay, given that the, I have these points belong to this cluster, these points belong to this cluster, these points belong to this cluster, run low rank matrix completion algorithm on each of those clusters to fill in the rest of them, right? And then repeat. And then see, okay, given that this is the whole, the whole element, oops, I should have turned off my teams, hopefully. Sorry about that. Hopefully my wife, hopefully it won't be too many incriminating messages come in. I would have been more worried with our department chair that people would have been swearing at me or something like that that you would have seen. But um, so, everybody, so that's the first method. It's just, it, this is like one of the state-of-the-art methods uh, for solving this, an iterative application of sparse subspace clustering um, interspersed with a low-rank matrix completion. And then the K-Grouse or KSSMD The K, the K grouse is instead of having just one subspace that you're going to uh, tilt the point to, you take a point and you check all of the subspaces that you have, see which one is closest, and tilt it to that one, and then repeat. So that's like, again, a very simple method. So, how well does like how well do these methods work? This is a harder problem, harder than matrix completion, because now I have the union of subspaces, not just one. How well do these methods work? And I have that same picture that I showed you for low rank matrix completion, where we took a matrix, now we put the points on the matrix on the union of uh, K subspaces of dimension R. And we tried to figure out, we ran, uh, if you run one of these clustering algorithms, or these uh, SCS, these, these algorithms, here I ran the zero fill SSC, which is the worst performing of it, but it's the first one that we did. How well can you do? How often can you identify whether the points belong to the same subspace? How often, this is a misclassification error of the points you know, on the subspace. And here, it, these, this algorithm works perfectly, more or less, until you have about half of the data missing. And then things start to go Haywire. So, but like, if we just knew the clusters, right, we should be able to do better, right? So somehow there's, if we were able to solve the discrete kind of clustering, so here's the intuition, discrete clustering part of this a little better, there should be some data regimes, some amount of missing data, at least for this size matrix that we were looking on, that we could somehow do better, right? And so that's the that's the takeaway message of the first part of this talk that I've hopefully set up okay, where we just talked about data science uh, problems a little bit, is that there is something that we can hope to improve upon. We'll never get better, regardless of how well we're able to solve this problem, we're never going to do better than 80 or 85%. Yes? What was the rough size of the, um, of the matrix? Of this one? I wish at Galesh were here. These, these was... Early on, I think they're relatively small, so this might be ambient dimension 30 and like maybe 200, not so many points, maybe two or 300 points, so N300 equals 30. Yeah, so you can, I, I think that the actual, I mean, you probably know this better than I do, but so like where this happens on the x-axis in these different cases is gonna depend on those dimensions, like importantly, but I think always, there's going to be two things. There's going to be this sharp, no, no good to very good. And I think it's also true that it, it's somehow there's going to be this shift because it's harder to do it when you also have to cluster. And so that's really sort of the takeaway message. So these numbers, 50 to 85%, this is not uh, so important, but just that to understand that there is some amount of missing data, right, for which we feel like better algorithms could do better. Yes? Each subspace um, in the 
in our made up data, it's probably not exactly the same, but uh, roughly the um, same. Um, if you match like the, the number of columns in the um, subspace clustering example, is it the same as the number of columns in this like, lower space? Uh, like, is, could the job be due to just the fewer, fewer data points? No, I think it's the same amount of information. So it should be more columns. Yeah, yeah, so it's the same amount of information uh, totally, so the same number of non-zero entry, so yeah, this is a bigger okay. problem. Good, good point, though. There was a chat. Do I have to answer my chats? Is that a question? Or do we don't answer questions in the... Oh, fill this chin. Oh. Oh, Michael. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So we did have blue-green, but like, so the, so he at least appreciated... Hi. Hi, Michael. Hi, we're good to see you. At least he appreciated my... Miles Davis joke. That's a famous, you know, song from his, his album. Okay. Um, all right. So this is where we this is where we left off in the sense of like, now I'm ready to say, integer programming is where we want to step in and say, can we do something a little bit better? And this is sort of like the discovery of, is how we did it when we were tasked with, you know, trying to solve this problem. This was funded research by American Family Insurance where they wanted us to look at this problem and we weren't sure we could do anything. So this was the first thing we did was to see maybe there's nothing nothing to do here, but at least we feel like we can do better than existing algorithms if we could somehow combine the clustering or handle that discrete aspect in a more holistic way rather than completely alternating between the two. That was sort of where we, and we are going to do it via integer programming, at least we're going to try. Okay, and so bear with me for a moment as I sort of explain. This was my idea, and so like this idea isn't what we implemented because it didn't work, but like bear with me in the sense of sometimes I think it's useful for people to see what doesn't work and try to give you some intuition about why it doesn't work, but also elements of this formulation are related to how we're going to do it for real uh, anyway. All right, so imagine, if you will, that we're going to have lots of decision variables like you would in a clustering type of problem. We're going to have one decision variable for every potential clustering of the points, for every subset of the points that I want to put together. I'm going to have one variable for those. And then if I knew the points that were going to go together, I should sort of know how much I like that set of points. I should be able to give you a cost for that set of points. There's different ways to do that. Here it would be maybe just by saying, how well can I, how close can I come to sort of exactly matching the points that I'm given X to some other, you know, uh, with some low rank approximation. And this could be the cost for like do you, how much I like that subset of points. And then it's very simple to like write an integer programming. We would write a set covering type of formulation for this that would say minimize the total you know, so here, you know, or maximize how much you like it, or minimize how much you don't like. Minimize how much you don't like it. Okay, you know, assigning every point to at least one cluster and choosing no more than k because you could only have k uh, subspaces. And then here we sort of encoded that they're each of our of rank r here. Right. So this is a an integer programming formulation. You might say, yeah, but your integer programming formulation has two to the n variables in it, okay, that's a very salient point. I don't like to solve those for too big of values of n, but that isn't the problem with this because as you've, if you've taken Dr. Gunlip's class, you all know about dynamic methods for solving these very large scale optimization problems that don't explicitly consider all those variables but do it in a dynamic manner, and we usually call that column generation. But that wasn't really why it didn't work. That wasn't the intuition, is that it was too hard for us, all those two to the n, to, to search those because you had to like fix when, when you, well, you know, we had to fix the assignment of the points that are going to go together. And so Jim was like, let's not be so rigid in, a, in like actually making, making that these points all have to go on the same subspace. But let's let try to delay that assignment decision a little bit longer, or let's let integer programming try to figure out what that assignment decision is for us. And so I said, yeah, I thought about that too. But then, if you start thinking about it, I'm going to have, 
you know, some number of subspaces I'm going to be considering. I'm going to have all these points. I'm going to have a variable of subspaces times points. Isn't this going to be too many variables? So that was my objection to this. Um, but let's write it down anyway and see where, where we go. So we can write such a formulation, an integer programming formulation down. So like it's very related, but actually a nicer way to think of it is the following, is that I'm going to consider some number t, and then this, I'm going to grow this set dynamically, but bear with me. Imagine that I just had this number t right here be very large, but I'm going to think of lots of potential candidate subspaces, and I'm going to have a basis u sub t for each one of those. Okay? So given that if I say enumerate those beforehand, we won't do that, but just bear with me for a moment and pretend we were going to, that I have all these potential subspaces to consider. Now we're going to use an integer programming formulation, not just to select the best k of those subspaces, but then also assign which points are going to go to which subspace. Does that make sense? And I'll write the formulation in a second, but then, you know, given in this, in this formulation, I need to know how much is it going to cost me to assign a point to a candidate subspace, and that really is just sort of like we can compute that by just project, this is, this is a, a fancy way of writing, that we can just compute that by sort of projecting onto the coordinates of the point that I know, I can sort of do this, and it's just a projection problem, so I can compute these costs as, you know, some sort of, there's a closed form solution for this optimization problem, it's a projection. Okay. Um, any questions on this? The notation is a little wonky, but at least hopefully the geometry or idea, geometric idea is clear. And then, so if I, these numbers I have to compute, so if I have these T subspaces given and I have the J points, I have to compute these numbers. I have these numbers of how much I like or the, the disutility of assigning point J to subspace T. And then I can write it as this integer programming formulation where I not just have, do I want to choose a particular subspace? I have binary variables for that, but I also have these binary assignment variables, right? So I'm going to minimize the total assignment cost. I'm going to make sure that each point is assigned to exactly one subspace. But I can't just assign the points willy-nilly to any subspace I like. I can only assign a point to a subspace if I'm selecting it as one of my K. Right? So this is very... It's, this is what our, our undergraduates would write this formulation down. This isn't where the, the artistry comes in. And so then we wrote this down and, and we looked at it for a little bit. Does this, does this formulation like ring a bell to, well, so the first point is that like, the reason I was like, didn't think this was going to be such a great formulation is that I knew these types of dynamic methods, we're not going to get all the way to two to the end, but we're going to need a thousand or 10,000 potential subspaces depending on the size of the problem. And we're going to solve problems with 100, or even 100 or 1,000 points. We're going to end up with like 10 to the, this formulation itself, even if I don't enumerate all the subspaces, has tens of millions of integer variables. And I don't like to solve, I don't, I like to solve large integer programs, but I don't like to just give this problem to Gurobi or Cplex because it, you know, it won't finish, okay? And so this was like the original objection. But then we looked at this structure for a little bit, and people in the audience, some people have worked on this problem before, they should look at this structure a little bit and say, this looks familiar. Should try to draw an analogy. This is like, a, like one of the oldest integer programs in all of the world. This is actually a facility location problem that like back when we, back when we actually did applications besides machine learning, we were doing things like you know, in supply chain and logistics and like we solved integer programs to figure out which facilities to open and which customers to assign to those facilities. And the, this is a perfect analogy to that where the facilities are the role of subspaces, which are my candidate subspaces am I going to allow points to be assigned to? And the points themselves are customers that I have to assign to one of those subspaces, right? So it really is just a facility location problem. Um, Maybe it's a little bit different in the sense of like at least the facility location problems I have worked on tend to have a lot more, more customers than facilities. But here it's going to be the opposite. We're going to probably be trying to solve problems that are going to have more candidate subspaces, more facilities than customers. It just be that we won't open so many of those facilities. Right? So that's the difference. Right? And so 
now that I know it's a facility location problem, or at least we figured it out, then I'm less scared because how, at least computationally, how do you solve large-scale facility location problems? You solve them with vendors decomposition. Um, there's a recent nice work. I mean, you'd be surprised. I mean, it's great. I really like this paper. I mean, it, uh, it appeared in Management Science by Piscetti, Luchik, and Sinnel. But all they did, I like it because it makes me think that maybe I someday might have a paper in Management Science, or because really what they did is just apply very classical techniques, but done engineered well and done in the right way, did Bender's decomposition for the facility location problem. So that's how we're going to solve this problem. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that right now. Questions? So here we go. So how would we do? This is actually, now I'm a little embarrassed because this is just like a intermediate to advanced level integer programming lecture at this point as to how would I write a vendor's reformulation of the facility location problem in this context. For those of you who don't know so much about vendor's decomposition, the idea is to eliminate those assignment variables, at least from the upper level problem. So we have no longer have assignment variables xjt, but instead we have some new surrogate variables. Here I call them wj, and that's supposed to be how much does it cost me to assign point j to a subspace. Okay, and and so and so then if wj needs to be at least, so this then phi j of z is the minimum assignment cost for the vector j to the collection of subspaces that are then parameterized by z. So it's either open, not open, or if I want to solve the linear program and relaxation of that problem, we're sort of like partially open. Right, so that's this function phi j of z. This is this classical Bender's reformulation, which then to compute phi j of z, I can write that as another optimization problem, which just finds the minimum sort of assignment cost for this given set of vectors z. So in classical Bender's decomposition, you solve a linear program, you get dual variables, you sort of build an you build a ever improving approximation of these value functions phi j of z. And in this context, what makes facility location work a little bit better is that you don't have to stare at this linear program very long to see that it's a very simple one to solve and you don't need to give it to the simplex method, but you can do it by sorting the objective function coefficients from smallest to largest and then assigning the point in some sense to the closest subspace or the amount of fractional closest subspaces. So that's what this slide says. So not only can you get a closed form for the primal solution of this subproblem, there's a closed form for the dual solution, and you can use that then in classical Bender's decomposition way to get an inequality, right, so this phi j of z is piecewise linear convex function. I'm going, to sol I'm going to solve it via cutting plane method, so I need like under approximating linear inequalities based on the convexity of phi, and they come, these are called Bender's cuts, they come exactly from the dual solutions, and here again, it's a closed form solution based on sort of sorting, it's a terrible notation that we invented, but like sorting, sorting the cost the CJTs that I, that I have for that particular point, and then sort of writing this inequality. That's, all right, so that's how I'm going to solve the linear programming relaxation of this problem via Fender's decomposition. I'm going to solve, if you haven't seen this before, I solve, well, I solve this master problem, actually the linear programming relaxation of this, where WJ, instead of having this phi J of Z, I just have a bunch of inequalities like this. I get a Z. I, I evaluate phi of z, and I either have computed phi of z exactly, or I get an, an inequality that improves the approximation. Oh boy, this is not the most exciting. So yeah, this is exactly, maybe I should have gone to here. So this is the Bender's master problem, where instead of wj greater or equal to phi j of z, I just have the other inequalities in z, and then just it's Bender's lower bounding approximation. So we solved that linear, that's how well we used to solve the linear program. Okay, so that's one of the decompositions we need to do to solve this problem. But then I told you that we were going to talk about, and this is the more interesting mathematical and empirical and computational issues involved with, like, I explicitly, I assumed that I had a good collection of subspaces, the Q 
candidate subspaces and bases for that use of one, one for each possible candidate. How am I going to get those, right? And most importantly, can, can I hopefully use optimization or linear programming to systematically tell me which subspaces might be better? And that's where, that's what we need to do in the column generation process. So we're not going to consider all infinitely many of these possible r-dimensional subspaces of rd, but we want to use the linear program to tell us, you know, is this, is this, is this subspace or this basis for this subspace improving? Right, so how do we do that? Well, we use linear programming, so we just go, <coughs> and given the solution of this linear program, right, there, we take the dual variables, we say if there was some other column or subspace out there that would be better, it would have a negative reduced cost. So this thing would be negative, and then that subspace could be improving. Um, and so, yeah, so if we write, so, but the CJT, right, so it see this, a lot of the notation isn't very good, I don't think, but the CJT, of course, is a function of the, the basis for the subspace for that basis you're considering. So we really kind of need to figure out how this thing sort of depends on the subspace, or the basis for the subspace that I'm going to add as a candidate. And it, so in order to do that, we need to remember how the basis uh, matrix sort of comes into the cost, right? And then we can sort of write this all together and sort of say what I really want to do, this is just a constant, so I want to maximize this thing, which is a, which is a function of u, which is this, uh, this very complicated looking uh, function, all right, which is just, I'm seeking a matrix U that maximizes, you know, this function, which I can write out in this, it's very complicated because here the summation, here we have one matrix U, but in these inner summations, like I'm sometimes looking at just this U omega J is just the, the basis, um, projected or sort of restricted to the columns that I observe, and then I have this, I take that and I have this inverse in there to do the projection. And so it's a quite a complicated looking function. And this is what I, if I really wanted to solve and find the best basis matrix U that maximizes or minimizes the reduced cost, but maximizes this negative of the reduced cost, this is what I need to solve. This is a very, if, you know, there's many optimization, especially non-linear optimization experts, Michael's on the I'll talk to him afterwards. If you know how to solve this problem, please let me know. Um, so how can we solve this? It's certainly non-convex. It's only mildly non-differentiable. I'm not so worried about that. But really, it's just because of this very complicated dependence on our matrix of variables U that I'm not holding out much hope for like a, a very good exact method for solving this problem. So like I said, I'm kind of new to the machine learning community. The one thing I've learned, or I understand about machine learning, at least it seems, is that like, from what I know, every problem in machine learning is just solved with steepest descent. And this is what I, I took that to heart. And so how are we gonna solve this complicated non-convex nonlinear program? We are going to solve it via steepest descent. And so that's the way we attempted to at least heuristically solve this pricing problem, because thankfully for us, it's not an impossible task to compute a gradient of that um, strange looking G function. So we can compute um, the gradient of the function, or at least the components of the gradient, sort of involve computing the weights when you do the projection. But it, so even computing the gradient requires us to do projections. Um, but we can do it. So given, given a, a choice of U, I can compute the function value, and as, as an artifact of computing g of u hat, I can actually, I need to compute these weights anyway, and I can compute a gradient as well. So it sort of comes for free by computing the function. And so we just did a steepest descent method. I started with some hopefully good, cho reasonable choice of u. I can compute a g of u and a gradient and took uh, a step. Getting the step size site, so the things I know about this now are you know, in these sort of steepest descent methods, you know, getting the step size right can be important, and we use this Polyak step size, which was an important component. 
And unlike many problems in machine learning that apparently no local optima exist, even though the, the problem is sort of uh, is non-convex, we did notice empirically that we would have, starting from different views, we would converge to different uh, local optima. So that was also a feature, yes. Okay, so we can put this all together. We have a mechanism, Bender's decomposition, for solving the linear programming relaxation of that problem. And then once we solve that linear programming relaxation, we get some dual variables and we go away. And actually, I didn't make this point before, but we can actually try to find that the pricing problem can decompose by, by points. So if we wanted to, we could try to find better, lots of, lots of better uh, subspaces, you know, one, you know, for each iteration. And we do that until we're either, we don't find any or improving subspaces, or we get tired, or we figure something like that. And then we, that's how we generate our, all of our candidate set of subspaces. And then we just go ahead and let integer programming back to Jim's original vision, both simultaneously select the best K out of these candidates and do the point assignment. All right. I need to talk about that. All right. So, oh, yes. I was wondering, um, is when you ran experiments, like, uh, was the number of subspaces you needed? Yeah, yeah, I'll, show, I'll come to that. So I'm yeah, going to yeah, tell you. you go waiting for that. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, I know. Everyone was waiting for the computational yeah, results. Yeah. Everybody wake up. <laughs> you all falling asleep. You all were a little bit bored. I was bored too, talking about vendors decomposition and pricing problem, all that sort of stuff. Octa, I was the only one who wasn't bored probably. <laughs> um, but now I'm going to tell you actually if it works and how it works and things like that. Yes? So that was the local optima. Um, I mean, there are symmetries in the problem, so I can imagine some of them are just due to like permutations of the labels. So, like, were there local optima which were truly not? Yeah, but I mean, I think even this, if they really were symmetries, they would get the same. Probably, they, it depends if the depends what the dual variables were. Yeah, it wasn't clear. But so, like, so when you're saying local optima, these were the ones which were truly worse than others. That were yeah. So definitely, when I computed the reduced cost, like sometimes you would you would run it and you would say, oh, I can't even find a improving reduced cost column because of like, and then, but then I'd run it again and like, oh, I found one, like this one's better. So it really is structurally different and I don't think it's just as a result of the symmetries in that case. Um, okay, so then I gotta tell you, we actually have, I'm only gonna tell you about sort of our results on synthetic data or sort of made up data. So we sort of know, we know for sure exactly that the points uh, that we're going to be trying to find and classify belong to K subspaces of uh, dimension R because we created them ourselves and then we can just, you know, see how we do under a variety of different settings like by removing more data and changing some of the things, comparing, uh, I'll show you. So we're comparing our method against sort of the most naive algorithm, the one, first one I told you about, the zero field subspace clustering this iterative, kind of iterative version of that where you throw in some low rank matrix completion as well. And then this, uh, this tilting one, this K grouse tilting one. Um, I'm gonna show you three pictures. One, which is the one probably, I think it's the most relevant one where I show you for each of these algorithms as we remove more and more data, how well does the classification error for the, each algorithm do? integer programming in these three. Then I'm gonna do this experiment where I sort of like, we fix the other things except the x-axis is gonna be, what's the ratio of the ambient dimension to the data dimension? So it'll be go from like the high rank case to something where uh, KR uh, gets smaller, or D gets bigger and bigger with respect to KR. And then I'm gonna show something about like, well, the, you know, cause it's all really about, all of these problems are easy it's not really about the size of the matrix or how much, in my opinion, in a way, this is maybe, this, there's probably even a theorems here and people know them. It's not really about the size of the matrix or how much data is missing. Things are scaled, it's sort of like how much information do you know? And so like here, we're gonna say, even if you have, we're gonna have fewer and fewer points per subspace, you know, it's related to how much data is missing, but it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, so these are the three pictures I have. Time to finish. Um, so here's the first one. So again, this is a this is a small problem where there's just 200 points 
in dimension 30, and the points belong to six subspaces of dimension 3. And we ran the experiment where we started, you know, uh, removing more and more and more data. In this case, you can see the naive method more early on starts getting it wrong. These better methods are better, like they, they are able to classify with more missing data, but in this case, if you really want to pull out the heavy machinery that is mixed into your linear programming, it's a, you know, it seems like we are able to, there is some data regime where we outperform what this other paper said were sort of state-of-the-art methods. Yes, Akhtar. So is there any noise in this? In this no, this is no noise. This is perfect. Um, it, yeah, <coughs> we've tried things with noise and on other data. It's, this, it's a very similar story. Um, depending on your noise model. And, and I, I think there's still, actually, that's an interesting, I think there's a lot more that we can do here. I'll get to that in a moment. But like, even if it's not just noise, but like real outliers, and you want to use like discrete optimization methodologies in combination with this to like exclude, you know, either whole points or components of points in a, in a systematic way. But this is the most stylized, uh, stylized example that you can think of. We know the ground truth, no noise. We could, you know, could do it perfectly. All right, so that's you know, some good news. This is actually, I think, an even more interesting picture in the sense of like our, so here we had 60% missing data where our method seems to, so we sort of cherry picked it in the sense of like, our method is able to do quite well with up to 60% missing data. And it doesn't matter so this, the takeaway message from this is it doesn't matter whether you're in the high rank matrix completion regime or D is, you know, uh, much larger than KR. You know, if you sort of scale, you know, sort of, you sort of, we had to scale the problems appropriately, but like we always can do it and these other methods seem to tend to work much better, well, except k grouse batch does pretty well regardless, but sort of work better you know, work worse, let's say, in the high rank matrix completion regime. Um, and then finally, the one where, so here we had 65% missing data, and we just had six subspaces of dimension three with ambient dimension 30, and then we just said how many, we just said the size of the matrix, we had how many points per subspace did we have. It's sort of related, like I said, to the first problem, but like, here, much earlier on, we, we need few, less and less information to do good or perfect recovery just because we're able to do the clustering right, or more holistically, I think is the takeaway from this picture. All right, so now we're gonna, this is, this is, so that's the great news. Like, I think this is a really good outcome. We were happy with this. It's like these pictures, I think, especially for rookies to the machine learning community to like come in and design an algorithm and make it work better than other state-of-the-art methods. We are happy with that. The bad news is it doesn't run as fast as we would like it to, and that's a, that might not be surprising. They say, I'm going to do integer programming. You probably shouldn't expect it to run as fast as or something that was designed to work in an online fashion. But actually, the takeaway message of this slide is that it's quite slow but it's not really, it's certainly, normally it would be like, oh, my branch of bound tree is so large that it's gonna take for forever. Integer programming, that portion of it isn't the bottleneck. The bottleneck of our method is really more numerical linear algebra. You can see all this time, sometimes this is like, what's 14,000 seconds? That's like four hours. So if this like four hours, you know, most of it is, so, 7,000 seconds of it, or actually 12,000 seconds of it, are computing the CJTs, doing these projections for all these subspaces, and even the pricing all of this time isn't actually computing the projections for when we're doing the gradient steps. And so it's really just linear algebra and all these linear algebra cal calculations that we haven't figured out how to do efficiently enough yet that's sort of the bottleneck here. It never, hardly ever has any branch and bound nodes. You can see even solving the Bender's LP relaxation, it, it's all, that's all relatively quickly. It's all, most of the time is in this numerical linear algebra. Yes, David. So if I just were to solve the LP. Which LP? The root LP. With which columns? 
all of the ones that I've generated from with which candidate set of columns? Okay. But like, yeah, I, even if you, if you could enumerate, and you can also see, yeah, someone else asked the question like, what is this capital T I talked about before? So yeah, so if you were just to solve the root LP with 140,000 you know, columns, and you just gave that to CPLEX, or like, so here's 37,000 columns, and you just were to give that to CPLEX, that would take like just a few, small number of seconds. And what's the integrality there? So like if you went back... Very small, because they almost always have no branch and bound nodes. So it's quite a good, like, th again, like I said, the, the, what I would, like, yeah, and you're thinking the same way, oh, what, the integer programming isn't the hard part here in the sense of, like, it's not a huge integrality gap. I don't need cutting planes. I mean, it's just a, you know, facility, lo it's a facility location formulation for these, at least for these costs that we're considering, there there's, doesn't seem to be large, of course, I only showed you numbers on, uh, synthetic data, so I don't have a complete answer to this, but at least for the problems we're solving, like the doc, you know, my diagnosis of this is, I don't need to work on the IP, I need to work on figuring out how to do, figuring out how to put the numbers and aspects of things that I'm doing in, in the algorithm, I need to do, if I want to make this run faster on larger problems, I need to do that better, or more approximators, things like that. Yes? Um, so what if you added the following I think about this as a facility location uh -huh. and then matching people there. Maybe I don't want to open a facility if I'm just putting one or two points there. You so can you definitely add those. It would it would um, it wouldn't really impact our method at all, um, especially if it's. Um, it depends a little bit on the, the types, the structure of the constraints you want to add. Con constraints that are kind of the same for every potential subspace have no impact on our problem. They're just another constant we have to sort of consider when doing the pricing. If like you have some complicated, a little bit more complicated constraints, then we have to consider how to put that into our pricing problem. But like that's another reason why if I have to go and try to like sell why this is like a good way to solve these machine learning problems. And it's your programming, one of it the great you know benefits it has is its extreme flexibility. If you want to like put complicated logical constraints about well, if you put that point on this subspace, then you can't put these three points or like all these other attributes. Yeah, we can do that. We can put it in our model. And it doesn't significantly impact many of the things that we want to do. Okay. And so I will end by saying uh, that I think we've, at least this is just preliminary work. Uh, I was going to say that I, I sort of feel like part of the machine learning community now because I've had a paper rejected by NeurIPS. Uh, so I really, so this, so we just are starting on, on this work. Um, and I think it's, I really think it's an interesting, people I don't think have looked at this, certainly people haven't looked at this problem in this type of context uh, before. And, and the things we want to do is to make it go faster, which like I said, the diagnosis is that we need to do some of these key core operations more quickly or maybe approximately at earlier steps to make it go faster. Um, a lot of people have asked us about, yeah, but it's very, especially, and we needed to do this in real applications or in many real applications, you don't really know either exactly how many subspaces you have K or their dimension R and you want the algorithm to kind of figure that out for you automatically. We have ideas on how we can do that and that's certainly going to go and extend. It's, it's a little bit harder, uh, but there's certainly ways we could do it. And then actually, this is a more, this is a, a more pie in the sky uh, goal for this, but really this whole facility location analogy, it, it isn't specific to this being, you know, that the, that the, what I'm trying to do is I have low rank subspaces. It really is like I have some points that I want to sort of cluster and then I got some model I want to apply to them to do something. And can we use integer programming to holistically do those two things together? And so that's what I'm hoping Akhilesh will figure out how to do sort of for the last chapter of his thesis. I think regardless of what we do there, it's going to, we, you're going to need to understand what's 
going to be specific to what that model is that we're going to have a union of. But I do think that's a, it's, and I don't think people have done that before. So I'm excited about this. I'll end with one last joke that I really like. So I gave this talk at a plenary, or at MOPTA, an earlier version of this talk. I don't know if you know Frank Curtis. He's a faculty at Lehigh. He's a smart aleck. So like he saw the talk, and then he sent me this four-panel uh, commentary of, uh, of my talk. It's, we have a great new idea. It's your idea, not Jim's, right? And then, so that's, that was Frank's commentary on my talk. I'm a little, couple minutes over. I'm happy to answer any more questions if you have more time or energy. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Questions? Oh, you can. Okay. When you do column generation, do you guys start with the end? No, that, yeah, I should have said a little bit more about that. And we tried many different, it, it, when you do column generation for real, you should never start with the empty set of columns. You should start with some, and, it, and as you can see, it, it didn't really matter. I mean, maybe that's not really true. From an LP perspective, it didn't matter how many columns we started with. And I started thinking about it a little bit more, but one of the reasons why our pricing takes so long is you have to compute these projections to each of these. So you want to be a little bit careful with which ones you put in. But like, actually, Oculus tried many different things. For the initial set of columns, he just chose some number of like randomly, you know, just randomly oriented subspaces, you know, that are with high probability probably close to orthogonal anyway. So of course you probably want them to be somehow like not all the same, but he just made some random subspaces and that worked that worked better than trying to be clever in this context. Or at least as well as trying to be clever. Don't be clever unless you have to. So, can you say something about the, the thing that you showed about the numerical linear algebra? Um, I mean, is it right in saying that any method which is not doing this kind of one column at a time, which is not sort of reading the matrix in an online way, will incur a similar cost? Or is it no, I don't think so. Be, you know, because not all of them are sort of these sort of matrix factorization, you know, oriented methods. Like the, oh, I see there. yeah, there just might be just some different types of types of methods. So I don't think it's a true statement that like everybody sort of has to to do this. And like partly it's us because we we are considering many candidate subspaces and even gradient steps. So even when we do a gradient step, I've got to like, oh, you know, like, and I'm going to do many gradient steps to hopefully get to the bottom, but I still have to like. And that's where I, I haven't figured out how to do it yet, is to try to like incrementally, you know. The problem is that every column, because every column has different elements missing, every column has its own U transpose U inverse, right? Has its own projection matrix uh, that needs to be updated with a gradient step. I don't know how to do that efficiently enough. David? So I was wondering if you thought about, rather than doing a pricing-based column generation, do something more in the style of multiplicative weights so as to approximately solve the LP. Um, and you know, after all, given what you know about the LP and likelihood that it's just going to be to be randomized rounding off of that, that it'll give you really good energy solutions, and it just may give a, be a faster way of getting the same expressivity and solving the LP. No, I hadn't thought of that, but I sh I'm going to now. <laughs> and yeah. I also wonder then, if, when you sort of stare at that from 30,000 feet, how that comes closer to sort of typical machine learning methods that, that it's sort of so, what, what actually, you know, how it, I don't know. Thank you. Is, it, is, yes, it, is the average linear algebra cost, which is maybe um, including some ideas from Gauss and the others, that is it. If you have some con subspaces given by bunch of orthonormal columns, you could change the subspace by getting rid of one column and throwing in another one or fucking four of the others. Sort of like a tilt, and, and that search would be much easier than component by component on all the entries.
I think you're right. That's sort of what I thank you for that. Like I think I'm I was thinking along those lines is like we need just a different you know, different type of optimization method that's like more suited, you know, for the linear algebra at hand um, that, you know, we won't do a full gradient, you know, step, but just like, yeah, you're right, I think we could do something much easier, still make progress, still descend, find better subspaces, but do it in a way that wasn't so heavy, heavy in each iteration. And that is definitely a, a next next step. I haven't talked to Steve Wright about this yet. Steve will tell me to do that and he'll figure it out for us probably. Do I have a question? Yes, Jeff. So is uh, your method, is that intrinsically it has to be batch something, not online data? I think so. Integer programming, I think we right. sort of probably, I hadn't really thought about like if I really wanted to do this in a way that more columns. But when you compare with some other methods there, do some other methods actually more suitable for online? So yeah. definitely this grouse was designed to be online. Okay. The zero fill subs, like the, the other ones are, no, they tend to, they are more, mm -hmm. you sort of assume you have all the data okay. beforehand. But like the zero fill subspace clustering, I should say a big advantage of that method was that it doesn't need to assume, because you're doing spectral clustering, it doesn't need, it will sort of help you figure out the right dimension of the subspaces and potentially how many you have. So it's a little bit more adaptive in that way. More questions? I have a couple on column generation, but we can take it offline. <laughs> I have one question about this N and KR. Yes. So why wouldn't it make sense to I mean, have D KR and, to D be larger and KR? Than, huh? D and KR. So D, D is KR. the ambient sorry, dimension. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. D and KR. Why wouldn't it make sense to have KR larger than D? When would it make sense to have KR? Why yeah. wouldn't it? I mean, like consider a cube and you, all your points are on the sides. Yeah. So you have two dimensional faces, you have six of them, but you live in three dimensional space. So this kind of problems can be relevant. Yeah, I think well, it right? can be. I think they do, they probably do exist. Even my little picture that I did oh, before, yes, yes, that, I, that was like really the structure <laughs> of the data was inherently four dimensional, but there it was. You know, if you just run matrix completion on that, it will give you a three-dimensional subspace, which in some sense is the best you can do, but you really want to try to figure things out even better. And so, yeah, so there, it makes sense to run this problem in a data regime beyond that as well. It certainly does. We didn't do that. I don't know why. But. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.